Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 342 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. Officially, the first day of spring, my darlings. It's spring. Ah, make sure you tie your slinkies to your running shoes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can bounce, bring. <laughs> ah, and it's going to be a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. We got some snow yesterday, actually. A little dusting. Looked like somebody uh, sprinkled some icing sugar over everything, which is really nice. Um, but um, today, today, officially, is the first day now <laughs> that the renovations are going to start. They did come yesterday uh, to do a walk around and an assessment, but today I hear is the first day that they're going to actually be stripping some siding off the house. And uh, we have to decide relatively quickly what uh, color we want to replace it. And I have a feeling that um, even though I'm going to get a say, <laughs> it's not going to be. <laughs> You get a say. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, I, I'll con- I'll take that under advisement and consider it. But it's going to be yellow. <laughs> sort of well, kind of what it already is, though. Like I, I, yeah, I kind of I I got him entertaining one of two other colors for about twenty two seconds. Mm-hmm. But I think that was the extent of my powers of persuasion. I'd paint it black. <laughs> there, that well. Yes, we do have one that's, uh, if not black, very, very, very dark charcoal. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, in the summer, how, how much that, heat yeah. is that to bringing in extra? So that's that. That's one of my um, well, my maybe- only hesitations for darker color. Well, you know how they have like the solar tiles, Solar City sells the tiles that are guaranteed for like 50 or 75 years or something like that. Oh. And they look like regular tiles. Okay. So you could, so the solar tiles, not, not panels, but tiles. So you redo your roof in these things. So okay. it's a roof, your entire roof is covered in solar cells. And I'm like, well, why don't we just put solar cells on the sides too? So you could generate energy to cool it in the summer with, with the heat pump, which also Right. In cool air, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We're probably moving to that eventually. Oh, boy. Okay. A uh, big uh, thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. And as you can hear, kits and cubbies, with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. So let's ask him, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Um, you know, when I, when I first woke up this morning, I was... Uh, feeling very groggy and almost 
hung over, which is weird because I didn't have anything to drink. I had two pints and a, and a, and a tipple of whiskey, a dram. I didn't even finish that dram. I poured a dram when we sat down to record and I drank maybe a third of it. And then was sitting on the coffee table and the doggy came over to say hello and that giant whip tail sent the glass flying. Oh no. Didn't break though. Didn't break. Uh, so yeah. So, uh, you know, um, that was still some good whiskey. Oh yeah. 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 But the, the thing is, I just, I don't understand why I woke up feeling so ugh, this morning, but you know, it's as, as time goes on, I take, uh, take my thing out for, for, for morning constitutional. Mm. And, uh, she normally wants to stay out a little bit longer, but this morning she was like, no, I'm ready to go back in. It's cold out. It was minus 16 with the wind chill. So she kind of dragged me back into the house after, you know, we drag her, we, we bring her down, we get her into the lobby and she sees a cat, an orange tabby that the neighbors have. And they take the cat and let the cat walk around the hall, which is completely fine. Um, she sees the cat and she's kind of okay. And then we get her into the vestibule on the other side of the glass. And that's when she goes crazy. <laughs> And, ah. to attack. and I don't know if it's attack or play, but she just starts crying. Like, <laughs> like it's kind of funny. Anyway, um, so we got her outside and she's fine now, but uh, she's wrapped up like a burrito in a blanket on her bed because <laughs> she, she got cold and normally she'd be sniffing around here. Nope. She's still on her bed wrapped in a blanket. So the 10 minutes we were out, she, she got a chill. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Ah, so that's, so, uh, yes, uh, I was, uh, explaining to the kids at the beginning going, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm, I'm watching a chair. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you were on doggy duty. Doggy duty. Yes. And then of course I have to come in and take a quick shower and get dressed. So yeah. 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 So, anyway, yeah. all done. So, Just, yeah, I really good. had a hard time waking up this morning. And have you been drinking enough water? Uh, yeah, I drank a lot of water last night. Okay pee several times in the middle of the night so yeah no and of course um any any man who has a um, a lady partner will discover that usually the lady partner has nine glasses of water spread throughout the bedroom so that you can hear the laughter yes <laughs> every every three feet or every meter there's a glass of water so if she has to get up to pee she can take a sip and then yes. take a sip on the way back in from the other one. And then there's a bottle of water beside the bed. I'm like, I, if I drank as much water as she did, I would probably pee my pants constantly. Hello. <laughs> um, and uh, kids, uh, you may see me uh, swinging my arms around uh, for some reason. I do not know how they got here. But overnight, um, four flies got into this room. Uh. And uh, yes, we have flies in the house already. Uh, and um, it's a little chilly. As as, <laughs> I know. I think maybe that's why they're in today. And uh, as soon as I turned, well, as soon as the music started for the countdown, four appeared out of nine nowhere and all simultaneously dive bombed me. So <laughs> it's like, wow. So it's like, whoa. <laughs> so you may see me do this a couple of times. <laughs> that makes sense as to why then. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not seeing things. Mm. <laughs> all right kids and cubs uh to um make good on a promise because yesterday i was really interested given that uh, former prime minister brian mulroney is laying in state and i had heard that the leaders of the parties had paid tribute to uh prime minister mulroney in the house of commons with his uh, wife uh, well his now widow and four children uh, in presence um and you, you heard a couple of clips here and there about stuff, about what people said. If you've been paying attention to the news, they always take a little sound clip. But the one I was interested in was the leader of the opposition, Miss Elizabeth May. Now, I was interested for two reasons. One, because uh, she's not allowed to speak unless she gets the full uh, unanimous consent of the House. Yes. Because she doesn't have official party status yet. And there have been a couple of times, sometimes like on International Women's Day or something like that, where uh, some naive... I assume from mm -hmm. the conservative ranks says no. Yeah. Yeah. And doesn't allow her to speak. Yeah. Um, International Women's Day won't let won't allow the woman member of parliament who's the leader of the party to speak. Yeah. That's Japanese. a good luck asshole. Yeah, well that happened in Ontario this year. It was Doug Ford's uh Ontario, Ontario Progressive Conservatives that uh, there was a motion to let, allow four or five women to speak and said no. Apparently, something happened afterwards that did finally 
uh, allow it. But uh, the first instinct was, no, you, you, you I, I'll speak for you mm-hmm. on Women's Day. Um, but there have been several instances where that, uh, that permission has been denied. Uh, now, she spoke for about 11 minutes, maybe a little under 11 minutes. I think they get 10 minutes in the house for this type of thing. So there's mm. a, uh, we have an 11-minute clip. Um, I was looking at it to pick something, and, and I couldn't. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to play it. Uh, okay. Because the interesting thing yesterday, and I didn't know it before I said it, that I was interested to hear what she was going to say, is that throughout the day, listening to the news, even like the five minute news ca- recap, mm-hmm. like what's going on right now, they showed the whole all thing. of them, f- no, didn't show the whole thing, but featured or mm-hmm. spoke about what it is that she said. Okay. Well, they, they only play, played a little clip, like a five mm-hmm. or 10 seconds of what Pierre Poliev had to say and whatnot. And then they moved on. And Joe Clark said something and whatnot. But they all made a point of Joe Clark? Yeah, Joe Clark. Was also in the house? Movie. No, not in the house. They oh, got okay. him in the scrum Excuse yesterday. Okay. But they were showing, yeah, and Aaron O'Toole made a comment yesterday and whatnot. We have all that. We might have all that stuff on, on, on another day. But everywhere, it was near unanimous. People were singling out what it okay. is that Miss May had to say and how much passion she had when she did say it. Well, they, they did work very closely together, so. Yeah, they did. So I figured I should just bring it to you because this is a moment in politics that we do not have enough of. And okay. I do not know why we wait until people die until we have them. Mm. Okay, well, let's just, uh, whoops, sorry. I, that that wasn't okay. supposed to happen. Well, here, let's just air the clip. Hell, I'm down here. <laughs> <laughs> For people listening at home, I went down to the bottom right-hand corner. <laughs> let's the clip here. Oops, I got to turn the sound down. Moving so the first few minutes speak. is the... Well, please say- the first few moments is them actually making sure that she, asking, the Speaker of the House asking if she has unanimous consent or not. Right, okay. Nay. Agreed. The House has heard the terms of the motion. All those opposed to the motion will see, please say nay. Carried. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you. A to la famille. To all of our former Prime Minister's family, Mila, Mark, Carolyn, my sincerest condolences. Very huge honor and very unlikely event in the life of a very passionate non conservative to serve as a member of the staff team for the Minister of Environment and ultimately over the years to become a friend of Brian Mulroney. I, I've never said this to the family, but I used to have this recurring dream after I resigned from the office, and there was a certain amount of bad blood from the other Conservatives, never, never Brian Mulroney, about me leaving uh, over my minister doing this little thing like breaking the law. And the thing about it was, I had this recurring dream that I kept running up to Brian Mulroney to say, I hope you know I love you. It was weird because I didn't know I felt that way when I was having this dream, but I had it over and over again. And then we got to be friends. And it was we became friends when I felt compelled as executive director of Sierra Club to write articles to say, look at this legacy, hello. And I was on the jury for who should be the greenest prime minister. And it wasn't close. This was in 2005. It wasn't like there were a lot of prime ministers who had that kind of record. So in thinking about my remarks today, I've decided there's no way I can actually speak to each of the accomplishments of the Mulroney government and of Brian Mulroney quite personally, personally picking up the phone and putting the negotiations to stop the logging of Guayahanas, putting them back into play by calling Bill Vanderzam and putting, I mean, this was hard work and heavy lifting and it was personal. Where it came from, I can't tell you, but I know it was profound and real and personal on issue after issue. So I've decided the only way I can get through them is to list them. I can hardly editorialize on the accomplishments because they are so many. But let's start with, it's under the category of under-promising and over-delivering the multinational effort to deal with acid rain to actually solve the issue, to make every meeting with the President of the United States of America our single top bilateral issue 
was an environmental issue. It was acid rain every time. Then it was the ozone layer. We didn't just put in place some ideas. Brian Mulroney quite literally saved all life on Earth when Canada stood up and organized the Montreal Protocol and saved the ozone layer so that now just is no longer being eroded. It's repairing itself. And I was never so proud as to see him at the 30th anniversary of the Montreal Protocol in Montreal when he even mentioned me in his speech at there. We were there in the same Congress where it was negotiated in September 1987. The Montreal Protocol is an astonishing accomplishment for this country. But it was Brian Mulroney personally who delivered it. It was the first international conference on the climate crisis in the last week of June 1988, which former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney opened and gave a speech that brought the House down and brought scientists from all around the world to their feet to cheer for what Stephen Schneider, one of the leading climate scientists, said, my God, this is our Woodstock. Prime Ministers also grew Harlem Brundtland of Norway opened that conference, the first one. But then the work kept going. The work to acknowledge and support the World Commission on Environment and Development and their landmark report, Our Common Future, to lead at the United Nations to create the Earth Summit for June 1992, to lead with heavy lifting to deliver the Treaty for the Protection of Biological Diversity and this is one of the hallmarks I was going to mention at the end. The things that Brian Mulroney did, not just standing up to his enemies, that's easy, standing up to his friends. So that when he saved the Biodiversity Convention, and he did quite personally save it, when George Bush tried to kill it, he was standing up to his friends. When he stood up to throw South Africa out of the Commonwealth, he had to stand up to his friend whom he loved, Maggie Thatcher, because it was wrong to ignore apartheid and let South Africa be a member of the Commonwealth family. He stood up against his friends, and he stood up to Ronald Reagan on acid rain, and he delivered an agreement between Canada and the U.S. that actually ended the scourge of acid rain pollution in Canada. Canada. He banned lead and gasoline. He banned the herbicide that was carcinogenic, Alachlor. He brought in the environmental legislation we still have, and some of which has been tragically repealed. He brought in the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. He brought in the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. He brought in Canada's only federal water policy, and he created new institutions, only some of which we still have. He brought in the National Roundtable on Environment and Economy. He created the International Institute for Sustainable Development. He created the post of Ambassador for the Environment. He did the early work that led to the creation of the Arctic Council. He brought in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreements, multilateral agreements between many levels of governments, provinces, and federally. And he brought in the national parks, one after the other after the other, Katinar Park, which was then we called Ellesmere, creating that on Ellesmere Island. Guayahanas, we talked earlier today in the House of the News of what's been done for the Haida, with the Haida Nation and acknowledging their sovereignty. But for Brian Mulroney to fly to Vancouver Island to sign the deal with Premier van der Zem, and I'll never forget Pat Carney, another dear friend we lost this year, saying to all the men gathered there, you know, a lot of what you've done in your political careers will be forgotten, but this will last. This will always be remembered. Guayahanas National Park, Canada's Galapagos, personally saved by Brian Mulroney. Yes, all the Haida elders who blocked the logging roads and got arrested can't take a thing away from their courage. But the personal courage of the elders who blocked the logging road would have come to a historical footnote if Brian Mulroney hadn't been willing to get a deal and get Bill Vanderzam back to the negotiating table. Grasslands National Park, Pacific Rim National Park, Georgian Bay National Park, the early work on the Rouge Valley. Making poverty history 
the best international development funding record Canada has ever had, the closest we've ever come to the Pearson target, was under Brian Mulroney when we still had a Canadian international development agency. Our funding commitments under Brian Mulroney were the most generous of Canada's whole history in international development, stepping up to respond to the Ethiopian famine. The problem is with this kind of resume, not only can you not pad it, you can't even list it and not run out of time. How did he do all this? Well, he had skills and talents. Being Irish, I can only suspect he actually physically once kissed the Blarney Stone. There's no real way to explain how he could charm the birds out of the trees, but he sure as heck could. And he could make people laugh. I loved his jokes so much. I, could, I feel like that old joke where you could just give the punchlines and the family will know which ones were the best. But, you know, I'm, do you know who I am? I'm the man who gives out the butter. These were great jokes. They made jo the timing. His comic timing was perfect. But one thing about Brian Moore and his humor, and he was great at it, there was never a joke at anyone's expense. There was never a cruel joke. And if there was ever a joke at someone's expense, it was his own self-deprecating humor at his own expense. Talking about the time back in 2005 when he missed the first award dinner for his being the greenest prime minister. And he talked about it later, about being in hospital and some old guy who looked pretty rough looking at him and saying, did you used to be Brian Mulroney? But he could make, I, he could, he, at your lowest moments, he could make you laugh, and that's another thing that I just can't say enough how grateful I am and how deeply honored I am, and if there's no explaining the generosity and the kindness of his heart, that when I was having low moments now and then, I couldn't believe it when my office would say, a former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney wants to talk to you on the phone. Are you kidding me? I'd love to tell you what he said, but it's so darn funny, but I really can't repeat it. I just... Dear Brian Mulroney, there aren't any pearly gates anywhere near this place. <laughs> like a bat out of hell, one would say. But still, I know where there's a, a proper welcome and open arms and angelic choirs for someone who deserved and deserves to come home. God bless you and your family and your children and your grandchildren and all who loved you. You lived well and you loved this country. Let us continue to try to meet that example of a good-hearted, kind, spirited, generous, and brilliant Canadian. Here, here. And that, Cats and Cubs, is why Miss Elizabeth May is frequently selected as the person most admired by her own peers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address a comment here from Carpet Bomber. Um, not The kids can't see it because it's from Twitter. Um, I'll put it on the screen and I'll, I'll address it quickly. Um, I believe in climate change and respect Miss May, but I think this is a little too dramatic and over-embellishing of Mulroney. He did some good things, but he, did, he never wore a halo. I'm not going to argue with you. Um, I'm going to agree with you, actually. What? Uh, this was a, a close, dear friend who was lamenting the loss of a close, dear friend. And she's going to triumph the goodness that he did. We all know about the badness. We know about the cash stuffed envelopes. We, we know these things. I've, I've got a book written by Stevie May called On the Take. Mm -hmm. It's about, oh my God, must be 30 years old now, the book. Yeah, probably. And uh, it will, it details, well-researched book, details all of the wrongdoings and the crookedness. But this is uh, an individual, Elizabeth May, the Green Party, who's concerned about the environment, 
that's her party stance is environment first. So, you know, she was paying a heartfelt tribute to the greenest prime minister ever, right? So, you know, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, on the take was Stevie Cameron. Stevie Cameron. Sorry, Stevie Cameron. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, um, yes, he didn't wear a halo. Um, but all that huge list of accomplishments on the environment and that huge list of accomplishments in other places. And she didn't mention things like you know, Charlottetown and Meech and GST and mm -hmm. free trade. All of them, which were uh, what we call in, uh, in French, des projets de société. Mm -hmm. Huge, large, transformative, socially transformative initiatives. Uh, some that worked for him, some that failed. He failed on Charlottetown and on Meech to actually mm -hmm. get the full agreement passed, but he did get everybody to agree on something to vote on in the first place twice. Yep. An attempt to bring Quebec back into the Constitution. And then, you know, free trade did go ahead and GST did go ahead. And, uh, you know, his work on apartheid, his work uh, on getting a lot of environmental, uh, you know, institutions and measures off the ground. So it's like when we look back in the United States, we talk about Richard Nixon mm -hmm. having formed the EPA. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we look in 2024, we'd never consider anybody on the right hand side of the spectrum of wanting to do anything whatsoever for the environment. But there was a time. When that was the other side of the coin, it was the other story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a, during back in the time when we used to call it environmental conservation. So therefore, mm -hmm. conservatives were into it. <laughs> um, but then it switched. We got caught in the in the the culture war thing instead. Pardon, well, I have a frog in my throat. That's okay. I'm going to go back to uh, to his uh, years as prime minister. I was not a fan at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was not a fan. I am going to acknowledge all of the good he did. I will also fully acknowledge a lot of the things he did I completely disagree with. Mm -hmm. Privatizing Air Canada being one of them. That was Selling enough our vaccine stuff. Yeah. yeah, we used to manufacture our own vaccines. He sold we that We used off. to be a world leader. That's right. We will be again because we're redoing it. But who's bringing that in? Current prime minister now. Liberal leader. So... Yeah. Yeah, look, you cannot sum up a person's life by only the bad things or the mistakes they made, and you cannot sum up a person's life by only the good things they did. It's called nuance, and we all have it, and we're all going to make mistakes. And as we get older, we learn and we try to do better each and every day, because when you know better, you do better. It's one of the mottos of the show that Mr. Uh, Beaver brought to us, and here's the thing. I agree with it. When you know better, you do better, or at least most of humanity tries to do better. Some people, here probably have Donald Trump, two examples, are people who just are going to do whatever the hell they want because they're convinced they're right and they're total narcissist and we're stupid, so they're going to do what they want to do. But most of humanity, when you learn a better way to do something, most of humanity will do it. So I think Brian Mulroney recognized that because who did he support? The current prime minister, the liberal leader. Justin Trudeau. He said, mm -hmm. he's the man. He's the guy. He's the progressive. What did John Baird say? Mm -hmm. The most progressive leader? And remember how he got slapped down the next day? Because I'm sure Mr. Harper took him to the woodshed on that one. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, yes, and uh, Carpet Bomber makes a comment here. Yes, I would have been very interested in hearing what Clyde Wells or yes. Gary Feldman had to say today today especially yeah yes but you know brian mulroney has not been prime minister since 1993 it's been 31 years yeah so with 31 years distance what would they have said about him it might be a little different than what people different. might expect might yeah. be maybe not who knows Maybe they I took mean, those 30 years and said, you know, kept on cursing his name under their breath every time they heard it, too. Well, it's quite possible, too. Some Trust people, me, there was a lot to curse. Some <laughs> people let uh, time heal wounds. Some people uh, make the wounds bigger. Case in point, two CFL guys from years ago at a CFL reunion. They were on the opposite side of teams. And they had a fight 50 years ago. They were sitting on a stage and started beating the hell out of one another with their canes. They still hated each other after 50 years. <laughs> from a single event in a Grey Cup game. So some people hold on to it, some people let it go. 
It's up to you to decide how you want to live your life. Holding on to a grudge, holding on to anger and hatred, holding on to that will only age you, harm you, and make your life miserable. It's up to you to decide how you want to live. I can't tell you that, but hanging on to grudges won't do you or anybody else any good. And here's the thing, the person you have to grudge with, they probably don't even know or don't even care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know sometimes people ask me, what do you think about X, X person, and whatnot? And if it's a person that is sometimes I've not had a positive experience with, my typical answer is I don't. I don't think about them at all. <laughs> what? Why not? You, nope. so, you know, here's the thing. Nope. You don't have to have an opinion on every single nope. damn thing. You don't. Sometimes you can just let it go and let a little bit more storage space in the brain for happy things instead of miserable things. Yep. What do you think about this person? I don't. I don't. Just not worth my time. <laughs> it's, it's Until not you brought their time. name up, I hadn't thought about them in years. Yeah. Oh. oh. Yeah. Let Seriously. it go, man. Let it go. Isn't that the song from, what is yes, it? Yes, Frozen. Disney? Thank you, Frozen. Let it go. And <laughs> <you're> anyway. <fine. laughs> that was good. That was good. You had me for a minute. You had me for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Fake well, frozen acting. Genius. Wasn't that also a song by Luba? Let it go. Let yes, it as well. Let it free your body. Let it, let it move its own. That's I, love that song. Go. I love that song a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. I was that, a big fan know, of Luba. That was the first time, actually, that song, Let It Go, that I watched a music video and noticed somebody and wondered, is that person gay? Oh, really? Yeah, because they had that whole scene when they're in that, like, sort of like the blip type balloon thing with the basket mm, like, they got whole people so dancing long. there's like there was one tall guy somewhere like in the middle maybe a little to the right of the screen who was like just dancing away with them in the group but like my eye just immediately was drawn to that person it's like is that person like representing i didn't know the term representing but that was like my thought at the time it was like just like I wonder, like this is only flashed mm -hmm. on the screen like for a couple of seconds, but it was the first time I got my I got a sense that there might have been someone on TV, right? Who was like me? Yeah, I'm sure that was a, an eye opening moment for you. Yeah, this uh, this thing from Scrappy Scrappy McBucky Ball more than ten years ago, a journalist doxed me on another platform, and I held a grudge with him for years before I let it go. But you let it go, right? And I bet you your life improved when you did that because that anger was gone. You, you, you know, sometimes you can let something go. When somebody's harmed you, you can let it go without forgiving them. And you can still be okay. Personally, I try and forgive them. Even if I don't say to them, I forgive you. If I forgive them in my own mind, I can let it go completely and move on. Just a little bit. That, I guess that's my advice for today. My words of wisdom for today. Really early in the show. <laughs> there you go. And uh, for uh, kids uh, who happen to be uh, on Twitter, um, friend of the pod, Craig Baird, who uh, has the Canadian History A or X. Great um, Twitter, great show. Yeah, uh, website is doing this thing uh, where he's having people vote on what is uh, Canada's greatest song. Mm -hmm. So he started with over like 128 songs or something, or, or even more than that before, because mm -hmm. he had people vote to actually was gonna, in, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. People got to vote to add the songs, what, and then the most the ones that got most vote got put into this random generator where they got put into like th this bracket, I guess. And right now he's in round two. We're down to the top sixty-four. So uh, if ever you are following him, uh, give him a little click because, uh, especially if you like Luba, because every now and then a Luba song comes along. I'm just putting. Um, I'm, I don't know if every time I, here. yeah, I don't know if every time. Um, I see your picture made it past the first round, but that was like her was signature her biggest, song. Yeah, that, that, her signature song, and it was the one that brought her to uh, the forefront of Canadian radio. Yeah. Because at the time, I mean, we're going back to the 80s when Canadian artists were still struggling to get heard. Yeah. And uh, there was a, a, a group of Canadian artists that paved the way for what the 90s became because at one point in the 90s, eight of the top 10 songs in Canada were by Canadian artists. And that was not just a one week thing that was like for about four years mm -hmm. sometimes it was all top 10 songs for canadian artists the 90s made i mean it started in the 70s with pierre juno setting the uh, cancon rules that's why they're called the juno awards by the way right and then that moved on from there to the 80s which much music and can, uh, factor 
which was the Canadian um, program to help fund artists uh, to film music videos. So much music helped break a lot of Canadian artists. And then the 90s, well, we all know about the 90s and how that broke through with grunge and, and metal and rock and, you know, all sort of started with Nirvana, if you will. And then the, the explosion of Canadian artists in the 90s led way to the early 2000s when Nickelback came in and rocked the world and is still doing it. Mm -hmm. This is how you remind me came out on September 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> I that, remember. That was a moment that changed things, right? Yeah. So, I remember a time not too long ago, I think that the number one country artist in the world was Shania Twain. The number one jazz artist in the world was Diana Krall. Mm -hmm. The number one pop artist in the world was Celine Dion. And I think there was a, the, the number one rock artist in the world was Alanis Morissette, all yeah. at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And um, for those, since we're going a little bit down memory lane and the Junos are coming up, uh, Luba was nominated for 12 Junos and won four, including Female Vocalist of the Year in 87, Best Video for How Many Rivers to Cross in 1986, which is probably her second signature song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was How Many Rivers to Cross. Earth and Sky, wasn't Yeah, it? that was an amazing That's song. Right. I have it on vinyl. Yeah, Female Vocalist of the Year in 86 and Female Vocalist of the Year in 85. So basically Female Vocalist of the Year, three years running. Yeah. Yeah, and then you know, nominated for a whole bunch of other ones anyway, along the way. So there you go. Uh, and if you're watching us on the Twitter feed somewhere and you want to join in the chat here, I will put our link uh, on the screen. It's not a clickable link; you'd have to uh, type it in, unfortunately. But it's YouTube backslash at True North Eager Beaver Media. We'll take you directly to our YouTube channel where you can join in the chat with all the other folks that are here. There's currently about a thousand people watching. Uh, across multiple platforms in the live feed. But if you want to join in the chat with the damn fam on our YouTube channel, you can do so at uh, uh, YouTube backslash at True North Eager Beaver Media. All right. Now, uh, the other thing I promised you that we would talk about today, uh, Kits and Cubs, was that vote we had in the House of Commons on the motion, the NDP proposed motion. Now, remember, Kits and Cubs motions are, are not legally binding and have no teeth and they i don't think that they can uh, oh no those are private members bills with money i'm not sure if mm. motions have anything that you can do with money or not so don't call me on that one um and the vote originally was supposed to be on an ndp motion to um recognize the palestinian state now, this comes on the back of a lot of things that uh, maybe didn't get a lot of play that happened elsewhere. But in the United States last week, uh, the leader of the Senate, Chuck Schumer, uh, got up and made a speech. And it was a speech that was heard around the world. Uh, the only way it could have been sent more shockwaves is if it had come out of the mouth of the president himself. But I'm guessing it came from the mouth of the Senate leader so that there could still be a little amount of distance mm -hmm. uh, away from the president so that uh, maybe something else can be negotiated. But um, during that speech, uh, Chuck Schumer, who I do believe is Jewish, if I'm not mistaken, um, called out Israel in a very, very impressive way. And even suggested or outright called for new elections in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that there was uh, also some talk about exporting to Israel uh, in the future defensive weapons only. So things that would help with the Iron Dome, but not um, offensive weapons. And maybe the United States refusing its typical move of using its veto at the United Nations on resolutions that would single out Israel. The main problem here is that President uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, or Prime Minister Netanyahu, sorry, is considering a full invasion of the city of Rafah in uh, the Gaza region. And the United States is basically calling this impending offensive campaign a red line. Mm -hmm. uh, they really, really do not want Netanyahu to do this. Netanyahu is basically saying, well, his mission is not over and he needs to absolutely go down there to eradicate Hamas completely. And he's not listening to anyone, but the United States is saying, um, yeah, this, um, 
how would you put it, unconditional support that you've been used to getting from us since 19 whatever whatever um, may have a few conditions and limits to it now. Parallel to that, you have the UN Food Agency reporting, and this happened a few hours after President Biden had a phone call with Netanyahu, that it's no longer a matter of whether or not if there will be famine in Palestine, but when. And in the north, it's pretty much imminent. About 70% of the roughly 300,000 Palestinians living in Gaza are facing catastrophic hunger, according to the UN Food Agency's report. And it seems that leaders of certain nations and certain multilateral organizations are accusing the government of Israel of using starvation as a weapon of war. So that's, that's what he's doing. Yeah. So that's what's going on sort of in the background there. Um, Trudeau, our prime minister, spoke with the war cabinet member, Benny Gantz. Mm -hmm. um, he's probably more to the right uh, on this issue than Netanyahu himself and expressed concern that Israel's plans defensive uh, on the, sorry, plans planned offensive on the southern city of Rafah, where about half a million displaced Palestinians are seeking shelter, uh, is probably not a good idea. Israel is also sending a team of high-ranking officials to the United States to discuss its plans to invade Rafa. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said that it would be a mistake that would take too many civilian lives. So he actually literally called it a mistake before they're doing it. And the United States are sending Secretary of State Anthony Blinken back to the region so he can talk. And I have a feeling, if I'm not mistaken, that Netanyahu is in the United States and might be addressing the Senate specifically. Um, don't quote me on that one. It's just a little thing I heard on the on the news, and I wasn't sure if I understood it co correctly. But that's the sense I got from what I heard. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the background. Uh, in the United States, as you know, there's a movement uh, from Arab Americans to put pressure on Mr. Biden to pay attention to this, uh, which has manifested itself uh, most notably in the primary in Michigan, where they got people to vote uncommitted, and uh, over about 10% or 11% of people did, which certainly got the attention of the administration, as you also know, in uh, the Democratic Party and in the Liberal Party, you are more likely to have people uh, as members of the party who see uh, one side or the other side of the issue as the one most uh, deserving of being supported in the NDP. It's more heavily pro-Palestinian in the conservative party. It's more heavily pro-Israel. And in the liberal party, you actually do see people taking either side or taking more moderate sides. But let's just say the spread is wider, so it's harder to satisfy everyone because it's impossible. As soon as you say something positive about Israel, people defending the Palestinian side yeah. get upset. And as soon as you say something, you know, that's somewhat conciliatory to the concept that Palestinians are not Hamas, then, you know, everybody just turns around and says, why are you supporting or propping up Hamas? So yeah. A lot of people don't want nuance to be part of this conversation, Clearly. but it is because it exists. And to that end, the NDP was trying to present a motion that the Canadian government should recognize the state of Palestine, you know, working towards a two-state solution. Now, we have a problem with that politically, however, um, two problems. Um, on the left side, uh, the statement is, well, how do you fight for a two-state solution if you're not going to recognize before you do that, that Palestine does constitute a state? Mm -hmm. And that was the NDP position. Um, the more conservative side of the position is anytime someone makes a comment like when our foreign affairs minister, Melanie Jolie, said that we would have to negotiate with Hamas mm -hmm. with regard to to freeing the hostages, but any negotiations about what the future of Israel and Palestine as two states living side by side would be could not involve Hamas. They forgot that second part. They just pretended she didn't say that second part of and course. only dealt with the first one and said, what do you mean we're going to deal with negotiations to deal with Hamas to mm -hmm. determine the future of Israel? It's not what she said. But as soon as you start to make that type of conciliatory statement, there's already somebody there willing to say, you know, I can't believe you gave Hamas a win. And sometimes that's even from within your own party, as was the case with um, MP Anthony Housefather, 
and there was another liberal MP whose name I, I do not know off the top of my head, but both of them uh, voted along with the conservatives on this particular motion. Mm -hmm. And Anthony House father is actually openly stating that he's reconsidering whether or not he can remain a member of the Liberal Party. It's it's that meaningful to him. Well, he said so, recognizing the rights of Palestinian people to a state of their own is his red line. Yeah. So he's having a problem with that. Um, personally, being an MP in Canada, I have difficulty seeing how you could put that issue above the national issue here in Canada. Um, but I also know that um, when you are a member of a certain ethnic group and something terrible is happening, um, sometimes you choose that. You, that's enough to make you put that first. And everybody's different. And there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, I just find it interesting as an elected MP that, for example, the situation of how Jewish people are being treated in Canada as a result of what is going on over mm -hmm. there is not the bigger concern. No um, kidding. Well, uh, uh, hate crimes against the Jewish community has gone up uh, 93% since October. Yeah. So, but again, that's my personal opinion. I don't know what his personal attachment is. He might have many, many family members live, living there. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like, and there is no wrong decision. Like I said, I'm just, I'm just saying as an MP, specifically in his role as MP, I find prioritizing something that's going on outside our borders over what's going on inside our borders an interesting choice. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that it's the wrong one. I, I, I you know, uh, <clears throat> People keep asking me to comment on the war. I feel bad for the innocents on both sides that are getting harmed by men's and men in positions of power who don't give a shit about the people. That's my take. That's it. Yeah. I've got nothing more to say than that because I don't understand the issue enough to make a, 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 a comment that is sensible in any way, shape, or form. I know it's been going on for thousands of years. I know that uh, it's a complex situation, and I know that Netanyahu is a tyrant, and Hamas are tyrants. And people are caught in the crossfire. Innocent people. Children are dying. They're starving people. <sighs> Am I taking a side? Yeah, I'm taking the side of the innocents who are getting harmed by all of this. That's my side. I just want people to be able to live in peace and harmony. That's all yeah. i got to say about it. I mean, what, what, what more can I add to the conversation? Yeah, I'm not Jewish, I mean, I'm not Palestinian, and I live in Canada. Right. And when you don't have... I have no horse in the race one way or the other. Mm. Right. I keep on mentioning exactly. I have friends who are Jewish, mm -hmm. who are very affected by what's going on, and I have friends who are Arab, mm -hmm. who are very affected by what's going on, and I'm just trying to be a good friend to both. Precisely. As much Precisely. as I can, right? And it's, so it's a, it's, it's not an obvious thing. And, and this is, I mean, people are dying. Yep. Look, it doesn't get more real. It doesn't get more emotional. It doesn't get more, doesn't appeal more to the passions than this. Right. So there are very few wrong answers. There's a lot of this is just what's real for you. And, you know, we have to hold space for that. Um, now the motion um, I would put it, was originally supposed to recognize Palestine as a state immediately. Um, and the Bloc Québécois had announced before that it would side with the NDP going into it. Um, the Liberals had decided that it would be a free vote for the backbenchers. Most likely cabinet was whipped uh, to vote in uh, one direction which would have been uh, originally against this motion. That's how it looked like it was going to happen. Uh, but instead, there were some negotiations on the wording of the motion, and it led to a vote of 204 in favor of it and 117 against, the 117 being mostly the, all the members of the Conservative Party and a couple members of the Liberal Party who voted with them. Um, now, the amendments one would say, softened the language. 
of the original NDP motion. Uh, but it led to all the members of the BQ, most of the members of the Liberal, all the members of the NDP, and all the members of the Green being able to vote for it. The amended motion uh, urges Canada to actively pursue the establishment of a Palestinian state as part of a negotiated two-state solution, but not pre-recognition of the state, as was the case in the original motion. A couple of other amendments uh, that came in, um, the Liberal Amendment changed basically seven of the nine components of the original motion. And, uh, for example, dropping the recognition of Palestine was one of the amendments. Uh, there was other language changed, and there was a demand added that Hamas lay down their arms, which was not another one. It was released uh, the hostages, but not necessarily, but not lay down their arms. So that was added to it. And then the motion commits Canada to stop arms sales to Israel and commits Canada to support the prosecution of all violations of international law in the region in the future. And uh, there was probably some softening of wording here to uh, uh, maybe this one, I'm not sure, but for the prosecution of all violations of international law rather than violations from Israel, mm -hmm. for example. And the motion comments Canada to stop arms sales to Israel. And I'm guessing that would probably be future arms sales, but maybe not uh, stopping the honoring of current contracts. That's usually that type of wording allows like henceforth we will not but whatever is still in play we will keep doing as opposed to because there are two levels when you stop selling arms you you know they're the ones where you break the contracts immediately in place and and you just you know er, <laughs> put a screeching mm -hmm. halt to it and then there are the ones where well, okay we'll keep on respecting the engagements that we have in place but no more after that so there may have been some subtle changes like that to to be able to, ma to, to make those kind of things. Uh, I haven't, uh, there's a tweet out there that does have a side-by-side -side comparative read from the beginning to the first one and the second one that I will take a look at later to see if there's anything else that I can pick out. But that seems to be the main thing uh, that has gone on over there, and that's the whole battle. Um, the liberals seem to have gotten... Um, some praise mm -hmm. from most parts from being able to bring in this amendment that would allow more people to agree and make the motion slightly less divisive. Uh, we know for a fact that strategically the Conservative Party of Canada have decided that their bread is better buttered uh, going in full in for a uh, I don't even know how to say this in the right way because um, I'm going to put, it, I'm not particularly convinced that the conservative support as mm. firm as it is for the Israel side is strictly a decision that is made out of the goodness of their hearts to support Israel. I do believe uh, that there is a financial component uh, related to it. I know that, how to put it, the Conservative Party likes to play on established tropes. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, we mentioned it a lot with the Muslim community. The established trope is that they are inherently violent and aggressive and so therefore for example when it comes to trying to keep gay people down like as we saw this summer fighting against trans rights then they try to um, rally that community to its side hoping that it will live true to the stereotype of them being aggressive and violent right. and whatnot and will cause that disruption um, we all know that the most famous trope with regard to Jewish people involves things having to do with money. Mm -hmm. um, Not and I personally Jewish believe Jewish. that the Conservative Party of Canada looks at Canada's Jewish community more as a piggy bank for donations. Oh, I would believe that in a heartbeat. I have no so, issue with believing that. I have no qualms with that statement whatsoever. Uh, I know, but it, we're, we're playing into tropes here mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. this. And... and that's why I'm trying to find the delicate words to be able to speak of this because, you know, when you hold an all night vote-a-thon mm -hmm. and go to a Hanukkah 
first day of Hanukkah menorah lighting ceremony mm -hmm. and say, I stand with you, the Jewish people, as you're voting no them, to yeah. funding a Holocaust museum and a yeah. Jewish community center in two different cities. Um, how much support do you really have for He's the Jewish community? He's talking about sides of his mouth. Really? Yeah. Um, so I, you know, and just as, you know, just uh, on the other side, one can make as cynical a point about the liberals. Well, you know, they sat there in the back room with their liberal bee counters and a calculator, and they calculated 1.8 million Muslims in Canada versus 400,000 Jewish people, and they went on the side of the votes, click, 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 and that's where their position is, right? Uh, other than the fact then, you know what? Yeah, I've been on this planet for 50 years, and... Um, other than the time where we got to the Oslo Accord and negotiations, there was never really any sense that any true move for peace that could be lasting was ever in full good faith engaged mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. uh, and that there have been certain people, um, Netanyahu being one of them, who have decided that it's probably in their best long-term interest politically to be a major obstacle to any real lasting piece. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll negotiate. We'll get right twice there. And then, you know, we'll sign stuff. And then now at the last minute, oh, but there's this one reason. Sorry, I just, I, I just can't let that one go. I guess we'll go back to doing the same thing that we've been doing for the last 60, 70 years. Um, yeah. Wow. So uh, I've never, I've never felt convinced myself oh, that there's a way and, you know, I don't know that there is. I, maybe there isn't. That, that's the whole point, right? Like, honestly, I don't know that there is. And I don't have any answers. I don't have any solutions. Um, let's everybody sit down at the table. We'll have a cup of coffee and see what we can figure out. And you know what we'll figure out? Not a damn thing. Mm -hmm. Not right. a damn thing because it's thousands of years of my side hates your side. You're both praying to the same God and your religion, both of them observe most of the same things. Yeah. So I could say like, you know, I won't count. You don't drink, you don't, you know. Yeah, I won't count the first 10 years of my life because I wasn't that politically aware, but let's say like for the last 40 years of my life, um, it's you know, it's literally been one person does something, another person reacts, we retaliate. You know, World War II happened, so therefore, you know, the Holocaust was horrible, so therefore, mm -hmm. you know, Israel, we always like, you know, the first time, Israel has a right to defend itself. This, yes. And it does, all sovereign nations do. Um it's not up for debate. Yeah, it's not up for debate. And then we, uh, but you know, but it's presented often as if like we're, we're trying that, that side's trying to be debated, but I've also seen X number of, you know, 40 years of, you know, people just being killed mm -hmm. and things not getting better. I've, I've been seeing 40 years of settlements. I've been seeing 40 years of, uh, the more extreme settlers. Uh, doing things to Palestinians, but I've also seen 40 years of, you know, PLO not keeping its word and Hamas mm -hmm. doing atrocious things. And, uh, you know, I, I can understand just like we are noticing that there are people in younger generations who don't seem to know as much as maybe they should about the Holocaust. Mm hmm because yeah, if true. we talk about my parents, my parents were alive when it happened. Yeah. My that's mom was right. born in 1939. Well, my dad was. He was born in 41. So he was very young when it happened, but he yeah. was alive. But they were born when it happened, right? Mm -hmm. It's like they have their parents mm -hmm. telling them if they were old or if they were too young. But we, had have, we had now have generations of people so who so may have been born from. to mm -hmm. people who weren't alive during World War II. Well, and therefore, it gets distant. Yeah. yeah. Then, then it's it's not something that someone you know who's mm -hmm. alive saw on TV on the news. Right now, it literally is in the history books that you're learning it, and you're learning from people. So, with that distance mm -hmm. of people not being so alive, that's why when we talk about World War, World War One, we have so very, very few veterans left alive mm -hmm. get their stories mm -hmm. while they're mm -hmm. alive, because there will be no one there, and the only people we're going to be hearing about it now is secondhand. Mm -hmm. and third hand there'll be no more first hand accounts well they're, they're, and I when, don't think there's any there's no world war one vets they're all gone they have been for a few years and world war two vets are 
there's not many left. Yeah. So, but, but I remember in that, you know, Remembrance Day ceremonies, you know, when we still had first World War One vets alive, it was mm -hmm. like, you know, like, like, make sure we talk to them. It's mm -hmm. very important because once you get that distance of there being nobody alive yet left in that generation to tell you firsthand what it was like, that's when it becomes much more easy to have those interpretations. Oh, well, the Holocaust didn't really happen or wasn't really real. Well, do, do you know anybody who was there? Yeah, well, that's, like, that's why Eisenhower sent in camera crews and journalists to record and document everything. Every, they took millions of photographs. He said, I want all of this documented, filmed, photographed, uh, put into spreadsheets, uh, ledgers, all of it. Document every, because some son of a bitch is going to come along someday and say it never happened. And we want to be able to show them that it did. It happened. We can't deny this. It took place. It was humanity at its worst. Worst. It's basest. So, um, but as we're getting away from that, it becomes all the more important to be sure that the record is right, that we agree on the record. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you have a generation now, and this is what you're talking about, the younger people and younger progressives who have seen attempts for peace happen and Israel blowing them up. Attempts for peace happen and Israel blowing them up. Palestinian people being forced to live in an apartheid situation and nothing really improving over a period of 20 or 30 years for them. I guess. And with the way media works these days and with the way social media works and with the way that you can live in an echo chamber, it's very, 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 very easy to come mm -hmm. up with the position that Israel has always, always, always been the bad guy that Israel, the government of Israel, is exploiting the terrible thing that happened in World mm -hmm. War II as license for it to do whatever it wants now. And that's not... You that's can't not. criticize us. This bad thing happened to us. And, you know, people are wondering, like, how far do you get to run on that? Mm -hmm. well, how I think long do you get to run, run on that? They've run out of runway on that one, okay? Because yeah. they, they keep using it as a trope. And it's like, yeah, never again. We fucking meant that. But you're, but you're committing you it right now. Yeah. You're doing it. Never again applies to you too. Exactly. Right. So that's why we take the position on the show that Palestinians are not Hamas and Israelis are not the current government of Israel. And Period. therefore, as citizens, when it comes to talking to our fellow Canadians who happen to be of Jewish origin or Jewish heritage, and Canadians who happen to be of Arab heritage or Islamic faith, that we don't create that same trope. Mm -hmm. that we don't assume that Jewish Canadians are Netanyahu and that Palestinian Canadians or Arab Canadians who are standing in solidarity are with Hamas. their brothers and sisters mm -hmm. are Hamas. That's it. Simple as that. We are Canadians yes. Period. who have people that we love and care about over there who are going through unimaginable. We've seen the pictures. We've seen the video. We've seen the films. We've seen the suffering. And it's beyond anything any of us could tolerate because, you know, we live pretty comfortable lives here in Canada. Even those of us who are, you know, marginalized or uh, suffering, maybe we're in poverty. Uh, nobody is shooting at us. Nobody is bombing the hell out of us. Nobody is trying to purposely starve us. Nobody is taking over our hospitals and not allowing us to get treatment. That's not happening here. So no matter how bad... You think your day is? Somebody over there has it so much worse. Yeah. So much worse. And that's why it's all the more important for us as Canadian citizens with each other to be kind and gentle in this period. I'm speaking even emotionally gentle. Mm -hmm. this, we're not going to solve this here. No. And it's not our protests on the street and counter protesting against each other here. It's not going to do That's going to solve it. Vandalizing Jewish community centers, firebombing mosques and synagogues anyone. like this. Not helping anyone. Not helping anyone. 
it's harming people here that have nothing to do with what's going on over there. Then there'll be people, well, you're, you're funding them. No, I just, I, <sighs> it's a no win situation, period. Yeah. Period. Yes. And right now, as I mentioned in another show, uh, maybe not here, I think it was in a, on Blackballed when I was on the other day, mm -hmm. um, our federal government at the moment, and this would be true of any federal government regardless of stripe, has a completely unenviable situation. I do not envy our government at all Ooh. at this moment because we live in a pluralistic nation. We're out of 40 million of us, or nearly 41 million of us, close to 2 million identify as Arab, as Arab or Muslim. Yes. And close to 400,000, if not close to 500,000, identify somehow as Jewish. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. On other sides. And both sides have people, Jewish or not, Arab or not, Islamic or not, who love and care about them. Yeah. All my friends who are Jewish, even though I'm not Jewish at all, the, clothes, the most Jewish thing about me is that I was born at a Jewish general hospital. Mm. <laughs> That's it. Seriously, in Montreal, that's it. I have no time. And same thing with Arab. Well, I'm even though I size, but that would be the closest per, thing for me. Yes. <laughs> or Persian, the right? '60s. That was yes. That's, you know, so it's like. But even though I have this look, and even though sometimes I sit in a taxi cab and someone speaks to me in Farsi first, mm -hmm. like this, I have nothing in common mm -hmm. at all. Nothing biologically in my DNA and whatnot related to that. But I care. Of course. About my friends. We don't want to see humanity suffering. Liz, so, and if they have people there, about there, over there that they love and care about, I care about that. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You don't even have to be my friend. You could be a total stranger to me. You have someone living over there who's living through this right now. You have my heart. Oh, yeah. Because I can't even begin to imagine. I have been so blessed to, been, to live my whole life in Canada. And I've never had to experience a moment like this. The it's closest bizarre. moment was when uh, Michael Ziaf Bebo did mm -hmm. what he did. I think I was too young for the FLQ. I might have, I'm not even sure. I can't even remember what year it happened. I might not have even have been born yet. This where I would have been very, very young. But that's the first, what happened on Parliament Hill that day, mm -hmm. I guess not the War Memorial, was the closest to anything like that that I have personally had any remote connection well, to. The only so other that's event I, mean. I remember is in the late 80s, uh, might have been 1990, I can't remember exactly, when a gentleman hijacked a, a Voyager bus and drove it, uh, had the driver drive it onto the hill. On Parliament Hill, and I think that was '89 or '90. I can't remember exactly when. Yes, that, I remember that as well. Yeah, that and 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 the the, um, the assault. I don't know if you can call it. Would you call that a terrorist attack? I guess I don't know. Uh, he's the guy's dead. You know, you shot to death in the center block. So uh, I don't know. It's. But I, I, do, I do recall that event, watching it live on television as it unfolded. And I thought, okay, they're bringing out the negotiators. And then they, the, they said, Our RCMP sharpshooters are positioned on buildings. I'm like, well, they better hope the negotiator does some negotiating because those guys do not miss. And they were able to talk him down. And they were able to get him off the bus. And nobody was harmed in the end, which is what you want. And I, I can't even remember what he was protesting why he did that i don't remember what it was for do you recall no i don't remember yeah that's 35 36 years ago something like that i'd have to go and look that up that's a difficult one you know the old memory banks aren't what they used to be multiple concussions to this dome mm -hmm. yeah we're gonna have to wrap um, sir i gotta yes. get to the office yeah i was just about to ask uh, that yeah. uh, i, I found in a 
an article here about it. Hopefully I'll be able to get it during the break that okay. happened. Um, Kits and Cups, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. And you have the mouths from which we want the word to come. So please tell all of your peeps and poops all about us. It makes us so very happy and it helps us out a lot. If you would like to support us in other ways... Like, for example, not wanting to miss an episode. Well, you don't have to, thanks to the Ray Girl, because she sponsored our pod page site. It's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters, with a hyphen between each one of those words, or you scan the QR code that just magically appeared underneath my goatee, and that will bring you to our pod page site. If you subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, you do not have to miss an episode. And we have Kit Ellen that says FLQ was in 1970. So yes, that was a little bit before my time. I don't even think I was a gleam in the eye. At that was too. <laughs> if you would like to support us in other ways, make like Kit Elaine and go to our True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page. And there we have three buttons for you to do what you want with. Like, share, subscribe, lick them, tweak them, click them. All of it helps us. Very, so so very much so that please do that. Like that that old tequila i uh, mean lick it slam it suck it lick it slam it suck it do it everybody Salt, click slam. that button mm. <laughs> <laughs> and if you would like to support us in yet another way if you go to our coffee page which you can do if you scan that qr code by mr grizzly's lovely dome or if you click in to your computer, coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver. There you will find the emergency hydration fund where you can make a donation to us. And that helps to ensure that our vocal cords remain saturated with moisture so that we can deliver this wonderful show that you all appreciate five days a week. And sometimes a little bonus stuff on the weekends too. Hey, you never know. We do the podcast <laughs> from time to time. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, anything that you can uh, contribute there really, really helps us out. Uh, we had a donation yesterday. Uh, so thank you very much for the person who did that. And of course, we will have uh, more appreciation later on. And we'll be able to do that. Uh, give you a shout out out loud. Um, all right, because democracy is something that you do, make sure you write those letters, kits and cubs. Uh, make sure that you sign the Hamilton Helps petition if you can. Uh, Kit Dan gave us an update at uh, the beginning of the show that Kit Angela will having be having her meeting with Mayor of Hamilton, Andrea Horvath, at 11 a.m. this morning. Okay. Let's hope that uh, she is able to be uh, persuasive in person because she certainly Jordan's has been mom. persuasive being on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So let's hope that persuasion continues because we need uh, our elected officials to make good decisions and to not make homelessness a policy choice. Mr. Grizzly, do you happen to have more words of wisdom? Because I know you got them out a little early about letting things go. Um, well, you know, cho choosing a side in this uh, Israel-Palestine thing is, that's your decision to make. I'm not going to tell you what to decide, but I mean, Try and remember the humanity of it all. There are children dying on both sides. People are starving. Their lives have been destroyed. All because a few men in power on each side of the dividing line want to eliminate the other. And all that does is harm innocence. And I'm just, I, you know, it, it, it's been going on for centuries. It's never going to end. And I don't know what to t tell you about uh, how to think you got to think for yourself you got to read as much information as you can and hopefully you can form your own opinion but i mean honestly choose the side of the innocence yep and none have. yep and none of us have any reason to believe that palestinians love their children any more or less than israelis love their exactly. own children exactly reminds me of that sings that sting song russians mm -hmm. love their children too yeah yep. All right. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, please roll those credits and we'll have a couple of things in the Easter. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. 
The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, a uh, couple of little notes here. Kit Cassie mentions to us that the, the province of Saskatchewan finally quietly signed the health care deal with the feds. Mm-hmm. Uh, Minister Mark Holland brought about $560 million there. It seems that Premier Scott Moe was not going to be at the signing session in Regina because, of course, he can't be seen uh, on video uh, doing anything that uh, suggests he might agree with liberals. So that yeah, happened. That would, that would be a shame. Um, yes. Uh, the answer to your question about what happened uh, with the, the bus thing on the hill, yes. it was uh, a man who was trying to protest a Syrian military involvement in Lebanon, thinking this tactic right. would attract media attention to the crisis. Um, <coughs> that's going on. Um, at the World Women's Curling Championships, uh, Team Canada had a big day yesterday facing the other two teams that were undefeated, Italy and Switzerland, who is undefeated in its last 47 games at the Worlds. And um, Canada delivered a defeat to both of them. Uh, the one to Switzerland happened relatively early mm-hmm. uh, in the match. The Sw- Switzerland conceded. So a Team Canada, I believe, is the only team that is perfect still, and they're currently on the ice against Japan. So let's t- uh, cheer for them. And uh, the inflation numbers came out yesterday. The core inflation number uh, dropped down from 2.9 to 2.8, which was a little unexpected. People were thinking that it might go up. Uh, But the bigger news is that core inflation, not including gasoline, which was at 3.2% the last time, has dropped down to 2.9% which is better. And food inflation, which was at 3.4%, dropped all the way down to 2.4%, a full one percentage in one month, which means for the first time since October 2021, food inflation is actually lower Oh, that's good. And core inflation, that's good. which is exactly where we want to be. Yes. And you notice that Pierre Polyev was nowhere. Of course. Nowhere thanking Trudeau for this, blaming Trudeau for this, or uh, acknowledging that something good had happened for the economy or food prices. Something bad, Trudeau bad. Something good, silence. Yep. So those were the snippets. Do you have anything, Mr. Grizzly? Yeah, I do. I have a clip. Uh, it's 17 seconds. It's from this hour, has 22 minutes, and it shows you what happens when Pierre Polyev is off script and somebody says something that he doesn't necessarily like or agree with. I don't know if you had a chance to see this. I did. I saw that it was going around, but I mm-hmm. absolutely had to get to bed yesterday, so okay. I hadn't watched it yet. So, and we were going to watch the show last night, and we missed it. We got into something else. And anyway, it'll fly. Yeah, right. I see that. Here's the clip. Wow, Pierre Pauly, I'm such an honor to meet. My name is Dan. I'm with 22 Minutes. It's so nice to meet you. I think you're doing an amazing job. If it was up to me, you'd be the leader of the opposition for the rest of your life. Well, I won't be, sadly, for you and and, and you and your, and your, but you know what? Uh, Wow, Pierre (laughs) Pauly, Yeah. He's also standing very weird. I think somebody pulled the strings on the corset a little too tight. Well, well, here's, why, why did he skip out on a debate? That might have something to do. That might with have it. something because you're you're uh, 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 oh darn! Why can't I remember the word duty head? Uh. <laughs> well, I mean, come on. He didn't have a snap back there. Every time he was asked about uh, children, gender block, puberty blockers, blah 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 blah. Justin Trudeau is dividing Canadian. That's not an answer to the fucking question. I know. Fuck, kid, say roasted pigeon. <laughs> yes, I believe that's a delica- delicacy in some places. Mm, especially in the House of Commons cafeteria. Mm. Mm. Oh, excuse me. Alrighty. I got to get out of here. Mm. I'm, I'm going to be late. Delicious. Mm. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll see you.